one. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Curless Mania. I'm glad you're back, and I have another person who's back on the channel. His name is Grant, and you can see by the balloons. We're ready to go. <laughs> it's a special day. They're releasing the balloons. Mm -hmm. um, how are you doing, Grant? Doing good, Tom. Hey, I appreciate you having me uh, on the show. Oh, I'm I'm excited to have you, as always. Well, um, we're gonna have you know, a good you, discussion i feel it yeah well you might and, and i just have to always say you might know him from the contrarians you might know him from his own channel grants rock warehouse check that out i mean he he really does talk about bands that other people i mean his tagline is i don't i talk about bands that other people don't talk about mm -hmm. that's true for the most part i mean there are bands we do you know you have to cover some bands that are out there but for the most part you're not going to see a lot of bands well, I've done Rush. You're not going to see a lot of bands that are covered a lot because those are already covered. Yeah. You know, like on my channel, I'm not going to cover the Beatles. What can you say about the Beatles? That They're my favorite band, but what can you say about them that hasn't already been said? I, so there's, I so Tom, there's plenty of other bands you can talk about. Is it going to, am I going to change the world that way? Well, probably not. But if I can turn on some people, same with the contrarians. If we can turn on some people, just one person can get turned on by whatever we're talking about. I figure our work is done here, you know? Absolutely. No, couldn't agree more. And, you know, he also made some appearances on the Sea of Tranquility as well. So yeah. if, you know, if you, Grant has been in a lot of different places, Ugh. he's a very busy man. Um, but check out his channel for sure. Give him some love over at Rock Grant's Rock Warehouse. It's a great channel, great music channel. Um, so to, tonight we are here to talk about one of the titans of AOR and rock radio, FM radio in this, in this, I mean, just rock FM radio generally, I was going to say seventies and eighties. I mean, yeah. it's all, of all time. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the mighty foreigner. And we are doing an album battle tonight. I call it an album battle. Is it really a battle? I don't know. Well, it's, it's, I'm, I'm upping the drama kinda. quite a bit over something we're just talking about these records really it's just a way to talk about these albums and and uh foreigner every time i talk to grant we end up talking about somehow foreigner comes up somehow some way so i figured you know what let's talk let's really talk about foreigner let's get down into it so we have two albums to talk about this evening we've had we have the debut <laughs> check that out hype sticker hype, i've hype got sticker the same number. one tom with the hype oh yeah yeah i was so excited to find this and with the hype sticker on it so what a great album. And then we have their follow-up, of course, Double Vision. The one now and that's up. the second pressing of it. Is it? The purple. Oh, yeah. Different this color. is this color, the brown was the original. And well, I've got one of these two, uh, double vision with the hype sticker on it too. I should have oh, idiot. What a, I, I'm a rookie, Tom. Just a rookie. <laughs> well, the CDs were easy to pull out. Oh, no, they're oh, they're much easier. Um, so so yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and throw it over to Grant for to talk about the debut. I mean, this is a very difficult. I just want to say it's a very difficult task. Um, I literally was studying and to the last minute I was trying to listen to the albums and go, which songs do I, which songs are worse? I don't know. I it was tough. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand it over to Grant to talk right. about the debut. It's all yours. Cool. Well, if anybody's watched my channel or uh, know anything about my story, you know, when I was like 10, I got turned on to the Beatles. That's where it all took place. And then I started to listen to a lot of AM radio or American Top 40. And this song happened to come on one day. And when I heard, uh, well, I should mention this track is feels like the first time. So that's the first single from this record um released in march of 77 so i was well young anyway so i heard it on the radio and it was like one of those moments you know the, there have been various moments in my life where i've heard a song or a track like when i first heard she loves you and i want to hold your hand i just it just i just stopped dead i was like 10 years old i just like never heard anything quite like it believe it or not this is another one of those moments when I heard feels like the first time on the radio coming out of those little tiny speakers, it was like magic. 
And when this came out, the critics were all kind of eh, about it. I think the foreigner albums that we're going to discuss tonight have aged a lot better. Um, but this is one of those records that it just took me by storm. And I easily could rate this a five out of five or 10 out of 10. Yeah, there's probably better records out there. But man, when you're a kid and you hear this, like Sticks Grand Illusion, this, there is something about it when you're young. These albums can just grab hold of you and just go through your life with them. Um, but this record came out in 1977. This is basically a combination of various English musicians and American musicians. Uh, Mick Jones came out, of, uh, he was in the band Spooky Tooth, played guitar. And then, of course, Lou Graham was in Black Sheep, which was an American band. They had a big, they were touring Black Sheep. Do you know the story of how Black Sheep, how he ended up getting into Foreigner? I think I know that they they were on tour and their band broke down. They were opening, they were going to go like support Kiss. Oh. But on tour and their band, they had a, an axe, lost an all accident. their equipment. Yeah. So basically ended the band. And then, you know, I think... uh. Um, Lou Graham had had some kind of meeting with uh, uh, Mick Jones prior or something or Mick Jones got a hold of him because he heard the Black Sheep album and he liked what he heard mm -hmm. and uh, you know Lou went to the Black Sheep band and said hey this guy wants me over here to sing he likes what I'm doing the Black Sheep boy said no we're not doing anything dude that's a great opportunity go for it so he yeah. took took a chance who knows what would have happened but it was gold mick yeah. jones songwriting along with lou graham songwriting a good band you've got ian mcdonald that was from king crimson in the band so he's a good player uh the other guys in the band you know not so well known um uh Ian uh what was I gonna say Al Greenwood I'm not sure where he came from um Dennis Elliott came from somewhere Ian Lloyd though did a lot of backing vocals on these records um uh, he was up for singing duties too and Ian Lloyd was in the band stories with Michael Brown so it's kind of related to in that uh what's the band Michael Brown was in before that uh oh shoot left bank Oh, 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 so I didn't know that. Kind of intertwined. Okay, that's um, a new one for me. But this Foreigner album, when I was a kid, was just took me by storm. I was able to get it. My aunt actually took me to, I remember she had a like a 73 Carmen Ghia and convertible. She took all <laughs> the kids. We went to Peaches in Columbus, Ohio. And Peaches was still around. And Peaches. And that Foreigner cassette because i was so hopped up on it and i was like staying with them while my folks went on a trip so i was playing it the whole weekend but anyway feels like the first time the first single cold as ice long long way from home three singles from it which are incredible but it also has other great the whole thing is really good catchy i, I don't want to call arena rock i don't think arena rock uh, was a term that existed then it was just a regular rock and roll band star writer this guy's knocker, invented arena rock <laughs> pretty much yeah it's all arena rock all came out around the same time because you had journey infinity you know you've have uh uh sticks grand illusion 77 was a big big big, big, year. big year big year yeah so but you've got great songs woman a woman very soulful and you look at the songwriting oh at at the war of the world oh cool for you anyways very good a lot of the tracks on here a lot of mick jones songs i don't know how they ended up doing the songwriting but the majority of the songs on here mick jones wrote you forgot some collaborations between mick jones lou graham and ian mcdonald al greenwood wrote with mick jones too so they were a little all over the place but to me even after all these years i still like this record i yeah. don't i really can't tear it i you know tom it's going to be hard for me to pick one of these because we were talking before i almost listened to both of these records and they both sound the same to me i know we have we're totally in different studios the the first record was recorded in new york Double Vision was recorded out in California at Sound City. 
But if you listen to these albums, they sound the same. You could have taken all these tracks and they do sound this. I mean, we were talking about mix this them earlier. up. It's yeah. just they sound. I mean, I remember thinking going into this that Double Vision sounded better, but it doesn't necessarily when you listen back to back. No, I think it sounds exactly the almost same. the same. Um, but what but, could I choose on here? What so from a production I think the whole standpoint, thing is great. You know, there's no difference. Yeah, there's no difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, the producers on here it was John Sinclair and Gary Lyons in collaboration with Mick and Ian McDonald. And that's pretty much what happened on Double Vision. Only that one was, um, I think that was produced by, yeah, Keith Olsen. Keith Olsen, yeah, who's Fleetwood who did, Mac fame. Fleetwood Mac. He did, did he do the next Foreigner album too? I can't remember. Oh, no, that was Roy Thomas Baker. Yes. Foreigner yes. always seemed to have different producers. Um, Keith and Olsen I read that, I read that they album. wanted... I'm sorry. It, no, I read that they wanted Roy Thomas Baker for the debut and they didn't get him. So there you go. That's what I read. I like what he did with head games. A lot mm -hmm. of people thought, thought that out. See, we're going to be on a tangent, ladies and gentlemen, thought that that album was a little bit like a step down. There's, there's just a lot more new wave elements to head games mm -hmm. than there are with these two records. Right. Like I, I said, both of these records to me sound the same, but the first album, Oh, I love it. It's one of my desert island discs. I'm going to give it a five out of five, a ten out of ten. I can't, Tom. I can't tear this album apart. It just, it just goes back with me so long that, you know, it's like an old friend, it's like an old friend. Yeah. And you might find the same with the next album when we talk about it, maybe. Yeah. But looking at the track listing on here, I think it's great. The sequencing's good. God. Think about it. A one-two punch feels like the first time in Cold as Ice, and then you go into Star Rider. Holy crap! And Head Knocker, which is a great rocker. The damage is done. Long, long way from home. That clavinet on there just kills. Woman, a <laughs> woman. War at war. War at war with the world. Too many Christmas. It's a great record. It come still on. stands up. I mean, you can't ask for. Uh, come on. I mean, it's just it's game over i mean so I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in on this record now and i i'm just gonna echo many <laughs> things you already said but uh as you said my 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 notes say the for the one two punch of feels like the first time in cold as ice is really crazy i mean it's like it's just in, insane they're both just bangers right out of the mm -hmm. gate um the vocals throughout the whole album of course you, i mean lou graham is just absolutely crushing it right. on this whole record uh so i don't even know because every every song i was making notes it's like great vocal great vocal everything's great vocal so he's just killing it um but i do like when mick jones takes a lead vocal he didn't do anything like after that after head games that's you know? true he kind of stopped after head games and you're right there's something about the back and forth vocal they do a couple of back and forths where mick will sing the verse and uh and lou comes in on the chorus mm-hmm uh, and that's a really cool dynamic um, that you're right. That did after head games, it never happened. It was over. Never, that was it for some reason. I'm not sure why that is, but, um, but like, as you said, feels like the first time cold is ice long, long way from home. All three, just perfect songs. I mean, just mm -hmm. bangers. Amazing. I mean, long, long way from home. I forgot how good that was. And I listened to it. And I go, Oh my God, that song is just so killer. I mean, between the, the rock, the guitar riff and, and, the arrangements throughout the whole record are so well done. Everything is like, like this. It's like the guitar mm -hmm. riff, then the synthesizer comes in, and then then the whole band comes in, then the drums come in. And by the way, I would say that Dennis Elliott is an is an underrated drummer. He is very he's rock solid throughout yeah. this whole record. And um, like you said, I love the rock songs on here. I mean, uh, at War with the World is just a great rocker. What a riff! um riffs galore people never talk about this but i think for one i think mick jones had a great guitar sound mm -hmm. great guitar sound oh, and God, he was yeah. a good player and he knew how to write a riff he's playing a gibson right most yeah, of the time les paul les paul yeah mm -hmm. um it has that les paul sound to it um and then head knocker is another great riff i mean that's just another amazing riff mm -hmm. um and then but the only the only time they kind of loses me a little bit, I'll say the only slight, very slight criticism I have is I'm not sure that I love the mid tempo ish, 
you know, like damage is done is, is sort of a slow burner. It's okay. I, I'm not ex that excited no, about that. I love it. Cause Lou Graham's vocal on that kills. It, it does. His vocal's great. And it's melodic. I mean, it's always everything with foreign is melodic. That's another mm -hmm. thing. It's like, even if you don't like it that much, still good, mel great melodies. Um, woman, a woman is sort of another mid tempo. Mm -hmm. So it sounds a little bit like ELO almost, um, but not quite as hooky. I mean, it's, but it's, it's good. Again, it's still good. Um, at war with the world is just we already talked about it's amazing fool for you anyway is sort of the acoustic ballad mid, sort of another mid tempo that one I'm not that excited about um, but the chorus is pretty good but it's not my favorite and then I need you is a great way to end uh, it's another solid swagger rocker and then mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting because it um, the chorus sort of slows down a little bit and then it goes but the uh, there's this amazing solo at the end of it so it's a great way to end the record and I have to agree with you I can't give this I gotta give it a 10 out of 10 or 5 out of 5 or whatever. yeah I don't yeah there's you know you get on every album there's gonna be something that you're not totally hip with but it doesn't mean it's bad just means that it's yeah just maybe not, not your cup of tea it's but exactly and, and it's still really really well done and still yeah you know, I, I, I still have like very huge respect. Um, and, um, yeah. And Ian, you know, it's funny because Ian McDonald talked about how I read that he said that he did felt that he had contributed a lot to the writing and didn't really get as much credit as he felt he should. Uh, but, <clears throat> but his contributions, I love the sax and the horns and the, uh, he puts that special ingredient in where all of a sudden there's horns coming in. You're like, well, there's horns and it mm -hmm. just gives it a different feel um so ultimately and it also as we talked about sonically it just sounds sounds unbelievable and uh i don't know they obviously spent a lot of time on recording so yeah i don't yeah i don't know really how long they took to do it or anything or lay down tracks but but the, it's the output is great phenomenal phenomenal so so yeah i'm just gonna i'm gonna go and say that this is another yeah i agree with you that it's, a, it's a five, i'm gonna give it a five out of five as well um so now we're moving on to part two with uh with double vision in 1978 um as yeah. you said same same lineup um mm -hmm. a year later they just bang out another record real quick but it's in california this time instead of new york um, so, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you take a double vision. Have at it. Yeah. Like we said, this is kind of like the cars and candio, both of those records. I know they're the same producer, but I always thought that the cars and candio were basically the same record. So they're all, the songwriting is very similar. The arrangements are very similar. Mm -hmm. Everything's very similar. And it's the same thing with this, but different producers, different studio a year later, it just seems how odd. But that's mm -hmm. okay. Oh, yeah. but this record too, since I was a kid and I dug all this, I welcomed Double Vision. I welcomed it, Tom. You were waiting for it. I was waiting, waiting for it. Yeah. Waiting for it to come on the radio so I could get my little microphone out and record it to my cassette tape. <laughs> um, Kids these days, they don't know the pleasure of that. They, they don't, don't know the it. they don't know what we had to go through to get it. They don't stuff. get it. Yeah. But look at this. We have a similar scenario that like on the first album, one, two punch, hot blooded and blue morning, blue day. And then the same thing with side two, double vision leads off side two, just like long, long way from home. So like all the singles are all, I wonder why that is funny how that is. It's interesting. You're absolutely correct. Same exact order and everything. And, um, yeah, well, this one, they've got the lyrics kind of broken up more. It looks like uh, at this point, um, well, Hot Blood lyrics by Lou Graham, uh, music by Mick Jones, Blue Morning, Blue Day, it's is another Graham, is another uh, Graham Jones collaboration. You still have a lot of, quite a few tracks that are just uh, Mick Jones. You're All I Am, which is a bit of a slow track, but it's great. Great Lou Graham vocal. Back Where You Belong. Love there that you track. You've got Mick Jones. Love yeah. is Taken, It's Toll, and Side One, and it's a kick-ass rocker. Yeah. It's almost like they've duplicated the same type of, you know, uh, sync, uh, what do I want to say? The the way it, the album is the set template, up. The template, the similar template. template. Yeah, yeah, it's like the same template. Side two opens up with Double Vision. Everyone's probably heard Double Vision. It's a stunning track. 
um, got an instrumental, Tremontalane, and that's that is yet uh, Al Greenwood, Ian McDonald. Uh, I've waited so long. Another great track, Mick Jones song, Lonely Children. Oh, a come great on. rocker. And then it yeah. ends with Spellbinder, which is Lou Graham. Well, it still is a collaboration between. You're getting more collaborations on here between Mick Jones and Lou Graham, and I think that's strong because I think when Mick and Lou collaborate, I think we get great songs. Hot Blooded, Blue Morning, Blue Day, Double Vision, Spellbinder, Gee, many Christmas. Those are great tracks, and they're all collaborations. Um, good Lord, people. Good Lord, people. See, now I look at this, and I'm going, God dang, this might rock harder than the first album. If you think about it, if you look at the track listing, hmm. And you're absolutely right. I mean, this is what hit me when we were when I went through this is that they are the same template. Then they and they have the same strengths. Mm -hmm. Same. It's it's like you said. It's like it's like the Twin Towers. It's like Rocks and Toys in the Attic. It's like Candio and the first Cars album. It's it's you know. Sometimes you could look at this and go, well, we've got that, you know, the instrumental that the second track on side two, you know, is that an indication of, um, is that fluff? Is that filler? No, but it's such a great instrumental. I'd say no. It's such a cool yeah, track. Dude, it's so it's a cool track. Even though it's instrumental, it's cool. Oh, Tom. But I'm with you. I did have that thought that, okay, there is one song with no words. So does that mean they're running out of inspiration a little bit? You could look at it like that, but the, that. the instrumental is so strong, I'd say no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've waited so long. I'm just looking over the track listing. I mean, if you're going to throw me, you're going to make me pick one. I'd still rate this a five out of five, 10 out of 10. But I mean, if I, if you're going to put a gun to my head and I have to pick one, I would have to go with the debut because of the, what the impact that it had on me when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. It comes but this back was all in the same time period. I loved this one just as much, but Never forget I guess your if, first love. That's exactly it. But I saw him when I was a kid, I saw him on this tour. You did. You saw him on the double vision tour. Yeah. Oh, where? Wow. That's cool. That, Played at uh, Columbus at uh, St. John's Arena, Ohio State campus, and Ambrosia opened up for him. Wow. Okay. And the crowd did not like Ambrosia. They said, Ooh, they're booing. You suck. And David Pack, who was the singer guitar player in Ambrosia, turned around and flipped off the audience and told them to F off. Good for him. And they just went ahead and played. But they were doing a lot of proggy stuff then. That's when Ambrosia was pretty prog still. So. They, you know, they had the long flowing robes and yeah, yeah. To, for them to open up a foreigner show, I don't know, but foreigner was great. It was the original lineup, and yeah. they were they were really. You remember that show being really good? Oh yeah, yeah. My yeah. folks took me. I couldn't drive, but my folks were very good about that. They would, if I wanted to go see a show, I took. I mean, they took me to see Sticks on Cornerstone. Nice. Okay, mm -hmm. so you saw Sticks in their prime too. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But they so were did, good. How old were you when you saw Foreign? Are we like 12, 13? Uh, 12, 13. Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's cool. I mean, that's great. And Sticks, yeah, Sticks and with, you know, I would say Cornerstone is still like prime primo Sticks. Mm -hmm. so, they were great. And yeah. uh, who opened up for that? That was Michael Stanley Band opened up for Sticks. Oh, I remember them. It was down in Athens at OU. They're from, they're from Ohio, Cleveland, right? Yeah. In the heartland. They did an album called The Heartland. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. But, um, you know, Tom, if you're going to make me choose one, I'm going to have to choose the first album. But like I said, both of these records are interchangeable mm -hmm. for me. Uh, I would recommend, if I was going to recommend anything to anybody, get the first three. Yeah. Head, get, oh, put yeah. head games in there. You get a little bit more of a new age thing. New mm -hmm. age. New wave uh, sprinkling of new wave on that record, but you've got, you know, head games, rev it on the red line. God. 17. 17. Um, you can kind of look at it and go, ah, oh, that's kind of cringy, but Hey, it was 1979, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. But, uh, I like all those records, but I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I'm, what do I'm do? A big, what's I'm one, a... what am I going to do, Tom? 
head games like you said the cars thing is kind of that goes like like the head games is almost like the panorama where it's like a you know a little bit of a change but it's still great you know i did there's a lot and then think about that then you've got shake it up and then you've got heartbeat city Mm -hmm. it's still kind of the same kind of following the same track it's kind of yeah because by the time you get to agent provocateur I mean that's pretty commercial. I don't like yeah, that get, very much. That's like yeah, kind of. Eh. I would say that Heartbeat. This is on a tangent. I would say Heartbeat City is four and a four. Right. Right. Exactly. Cars. Exactly. That's exactly right. So it's pretty weird how it's like the, it, you brought that up, and now it's like wow, they kind of did yeah, fall. Did. The yeah. album track is like the same, but um, but yeah, I'm gonna go with you know I'm I'm with you. I, I mean Double Vision. I mean. The, the the title track is unbelievable. Hot blooded blue, blue morning blue day, we are amazing tracks. Those three are right. yeah, three bangers on this one, and then three bangers. I mean, this is like the same exact thing, and then um and then a couple rockers that are lonely children. I love I love uh back where you belong. I don't know why I love that one so much. And like you said, it's a Mick Jones vocal, but they do you know the another thing I want to point out. There's a lot of gang sort of harmony stuff that goes on on both of these records. Um, but that whole thing at the end where he's, you know, back where you belong, long, long, it just, he's, it's so well done. Um, and I mean, like you said, Tramontane, the, 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 um, the instrumental is, I just find that interesting. It's sort of an interesting little detour, even though there's no words. Um, it's just a cool track. I remember like back in the day, just being like, oh, this is a cool song. Um, and Lonely Children is another just killer. And Spellbinder, like you said, Spellbinder, I always forget how great Spellbinder is. You're like, you listen to the very end of the record, you go, oh my God, that's right. This is like an awesome ending track. So I don't want to repeat a bunch of things because we're already, we're just repeating ourselves. But essentially, I see it as the same template. They're twin towers. They're both five out of five. If I have to pick, I got to go, I'm going to go double vision for the same reasons. Because Double Vision was one of the first records I ever bought. Okay. Well, and so there I, you go. Similar thing. So it's very, it always comes back to the personal thing where I remember going to Scotty's in Summit, New Jersey and, and seeing this on the rack. And I had heard Hot Blooded and I was like, I got to have that record. Because I Hot Blooded just thought was just what a great rock song that is. I got to have that album. So I brought it home and I was not disappointed. I wore the grooves out of this thing. So um so it's for the same reasons just personal reasons it's more sentimental for me uh but but really as we've said three times these are both amazing records i could pick either of them and as you said head games is i think is a is an underrated classic as well yeah you only get one mick jones vocal on that is that modern like day modern day mm-hmm. yeah um that's but another you get record. two vocals on each of the previous records i mean i dig it it just could you say those are filler? But I don't know. I dig it because it does break up the record a little bit. So a lot of people say that it's a step down, and it you know you could you could argue that. I'm not going to say you couldn't. I argue. mean, I like Mick Jones' voice. Yeah, I do too. I mean, he's okay. He's I don't know. I just miss it. I just it's just something about it. It's nice to break up the the record like that. Yeah. And when he didn't sing anything like on Four and a Four, I'm going well. Okay. I mean, yeah. Lou can handle it. Of course, but yeah, I mean, we're going to go off on a tangent as we always do. So, what is your take on Foreigner Four? I always ask people this because I, well, I like Foreigner Four. Yeah, but it's the last yeah. great Foreigner album. It's the last great one. Yeah, yeah. I miss not having the rest of the band there. Yeah, but it's okay. The songs are good. Jukebox Hero. We used to play that in the band back in the day. I mean, Jukebox Hero, Break It Up. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of poppy. To some degree, I think waiting for a girl like you is incredible. Lou Wayne, it kind of reminds me, you know what? I never really thought about it, but looking at the tracks, like Lou Wayne and stuff, kind of reminds me of Aria Speedwagon, High Infidelity, kind of. In yeah, bit. I agree. I agree with that. I think that's pretty um, good. Investment. I'm going to win's great. Woman in Black's good. But I don't like this. I know this is their major record that sold a bazillion. Yeah. Uh, you know, urgent was a big urgent. hit yeah but looking at the track listings i'm going this isn't i still like the first three better yeah so if yeah. i'm going to rate them 
I don't know. Over the years, I never thought I uh, head games would be like one of my favorites, but I really, if I'm going to listen to one, that's the one usually I pick out. Well, it's because it's so underrated. It's so like, it's an, under, it, it, it's not overplayed. It's very underrated. Head games is the title tracks. The only one that got a lot of play. Um, but this, you know, but this record, if you look at four and a four, the reviews for it are four star. This is like the best. I know. This is people know. consider it the masterpiece. That's why I always ask people because it's like, I don't know that I love four as much as, I mean, I, I, it has that Mutt Lang thing going on too, which kind of makes it sound a little like Def Leppard at times. You know what I mean? It's got that. Sad, but that not, it does, but it's not like terrible though. Yeah. There's a lot of those Def yeah. Leppard albums. If you listen to them, it's like, God, it just, ugh. Yeah. It's a lot. It's really so dated. I think this yeah. dates better. Yeah. I, I tend to agree. I, and I, I think that actually it's funny that you say that because I, I listened to a Lou Graham interview and they talked to him about uh, how, Mutt, apparently Mutt Lang had just got, gotten off working with ACDC and he mm -hmm. wanted him to scream during the verses during Jukebox Hero. He wanted him to go all out. And Lou said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He goes, I know you just, you're into this ACDC thing. He's like, but we're not, I love Bon Scott too, but I'm not Bon Scott. He's not and, that kind of singer. He's like yeah, Paul Rogers. Somewhere, yeah, exactly. You know. And he, and he said something like, I want it to be a slow burn and then really release in the chorus. That's what I want. And Mick backed him up and they, they backed him off that. So it's interesting that maybe, maybe they pulled the reins in on Mutt a little bit, you know? Well, Lou was talking about when I saw him on the eighties cruise, he was there for an interview. He was talking about jukebox hero. It's pretty high up in his register for oh, him really? to sing yeah. that stuff. Yeah. It was tough. You just think about that. That one guitar. I mean, he's like way up there. Yeah. He's yeah. Screaming. He, I don't, I think he was worried about his voice or whatever, because that's, pushing it a little bit too much for him yeah i mean he can sing it mm -hmm. wonderful sounding vocal cords but you know that's not really his thing but he did it he can do it yeah but i do like it i do like the sound like waiting for a girl like you i like the sound of that oh that's a good song like the that. record i like the sound of the record yeah yeah but i don't think that necessarily the songwriting is as good god this is contrarian not quite as good as what came before. I, I, I tend to agree. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm, I'm not just agreeing with you to agree with you. I, that's my viewpoint as well. I think the first three, there's a magic to that original lineup. That's kind of gets missed a little bit gone when four hits. And now you've got just Lou Mick and Del Dennis Elliott. And of course you got Rick Wells, which is Rick Wells is great. no shame in that game. No, he yeah. was playing with uh, Peter Frampton played with uh, David Gilmore. Gilmore. And yeah i don't hey fine with me but well, i do think that the, possibly it did shake up the uh chemistry a bit yeah i just i just think that there's the there's this all like i said earlier about the arrangements and everything weaving in and out of each other and there's just and and i think ian mcdonald did have a lot to do with some of that stuff too um he was you know like you said from king crimson and and he was well respected um and a great musician so i think he had something to do with some of that <laughs> an intricate arrangement things that were going on and 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 really four has like a very stripped the kind of stripped down sound again like you said down to four people and it's just this stripped down thing and it's not there's nothing wrong with it it's no. just different you know it's just i mean that's what mick jones wanted he wanted to strip it down some yeah yeah that's fine but yeah. i don't know it was because if did head games not sell as many records i don't know what the whole i what the uh, motivation was, but it didn't. You know. You're it didn't. From what I understand, it it was a kind of a disappointment because I mean the first two just were just rockets and sold millions. Mm -hmm. Right, you know. I think the third one was still did well, but it wasn't. It's one of those where it's like, oh, you're disappointed with that many records sold. Okay, but it was a disappointment just in you know, um, just from what had come before, mm -hmm. and so I think that they for four they really bear. You know, we got to bear down and get back to where we were. I think they because from what I understand, they worked really hard on four um yeah make sure that it was a hit um I'd say yeah and, and, and i think agent provocateur you know as far as riding on the coattails of four and or four i mean it got like to number five in the uk and it what it getting yeah. you it reached wait a minute it got to number one in the uk and it got to number five in the united states but it to me i could never ever get through this record a lot of people think that it's underrated but i don't i just can't get used to the drum sound on it you know that was yesterday's a great song 
Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you can't not deny that I Want to Know What Love Is is a great track. You cannot deny that. It was a screaming hit. <laughs> but there's a lot of other songs on here that I like Stranger in My Own House I couldn't get into and I don't know. I could never get into it. Yeah, I'm, I I never I, I gave it a chance and I never it never was like, wow, this album's great. It never hit me. I, I there was something about it. I think it I think it sort of falls prey to the that's where they start falling a little bit prey to the 80s production tropes a little bit. And that's where it loses me, Tom. Yeah, because it's yeah. two 80s. Mm hmm. It starts getting a little too 80s. And, and four and a four. Still, you can still play that. It doesn't sound dated because absolutely. it doesn't have all that gimmick, gimmicky. I mean, yeah, it's got keyboards, but they're still analog keyboards. They're not like digital keyboard sounds. And it still ages well. Yeah. It's um, aged way better than Agent Provocateur for no question. Yeah. I, um, I've and, got uh, it. Probably ought to listen to it again and. I haven't listened to it in a long time. Yeah. Give it another chance. Maybe it'll take hold. <laughs> you never know. Sometimes that happens. You listen to an album years later, you're like, oh, wow, I, I kind of like this now. But, uh, man, I do like That Was Yesterday. That's a great That track. Was Yesterday is a cool track. That's a good song. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I want to know where Love it. Do you know the, the, the story? I just heard about the story with the, <clears throat> the writing credits on I Want to Know What Love Is. Um, oh. Have you heard this? Uh, well, Lou Graham talked about it on the 80s cruise. Did he? Okay. So you've heard it. Yeah. That uh, Mick basically took all the songwriting credit for himself. Yep. And it was obviously a huge source point, sore point, because he talked, Lou yeah. Graham talks about it a lot. Yeah. He's uh, pissed still. He, he was not happy about that because he said, I was there when it was like basic, it was say it was like a bare bones of a song, and I was helping him to knock mm -hmm. that thing into shape. And he's like, they did the paper. Did he talk about the paper thing where they put, you know, they write the percentage on a piece of paper and yeah. they give it to each other. And he's like, are you kidding me? He said like, you know, he, his, the original Lou uh, Mick came back with, you have 5% and I've got 95 or something like that. <laughs> he was like, I'm insulted. I can't believe you said that. So anyway. Yeah. That was a sore subject. Well, I think about all the stuff that they've done. As a partnership, I don't know if they're how much of partnership, but Lou was still in the band for God's sake. We know it was Mick Jones' band. We know we understand that, mm -hmm. but the the amount of collaborations that Lou Graham and Mick Jones did. I mean, if you're just looking at uh, Agent Provocateur, there's oh my God, collaborations galore. There's one just the song Two Different Worlds" is just a Lou Graham song. Okay, most of the whole thing was Jones Graham, other than. I want to know what love is because, yep. you know, I think Mick Jones knew it was going to be huge and he, he didn't want to share knew it. He knew it. He knew, he knew it. it. Yep. And he wanted just to say Mick Jones on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the beginning of the end. Apparently that was a, that, that, that was that, it. That, that became the sore spot. And then they never quite, I think, I don't think they ever recovered from that. Um, Cause you, you, you know, you've been in bands. It's like, when you start getting bad blood, you can't, it's hard to be excited to be in the band anymore. And you just, yeah. You... And, and I think Foreigner 4, because <clears throat> I went and looked at, let's look at the songwriting on Foreigner 4. Things I think really started to shift on Foreigner 4, because all the tracks are considered written by Mick Jones with additional songwriting. Lou Graham did want tracks one and two, four and five, and nine and 10. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of, a lot. a lot of a lot of mick jones yeah so yeah i don't know i mean mick jones is, is always his band i think that he was like hey this is my band i brought you in here i mean it's just funny though because i think that i this is the thought i had when i heard that story the 95 five thing i thought mm. and he said he said forget it i'm so insulted you just take 100 percent. forget it and you mm -hmm. know i'm so angry i'm so mad i'm thinking and he did i'm thinking dude five percent of that song is still a ton of money like I would have taken the five percent, but uh, but he already had, like you said, he had already co-written a ton of hits. I don't think he was hurting for money. No, but yeah. still, it's just the fact that Lou was in there developing that song. I don't know, whatever. He was just this insulted. Was, he was mad. He was insulted. Yeah. So I get it. I totally understand. But you know, if I'm going to recommend anything, though, ladies and gentlemen, I'll backpedal. Get the first three, but the first two definitely are. Foreigner and Double Vision are must. Because that, to me, when we're talking about Foreigner catalog, when I think true Foreigner, 
it's that original lineup and the way those records sound and Ian McDonald supplying saxophone or flute or whatever the track needed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just the, it's just the chemistry of that band. The foreigner four doesn't have that, Mm -hmm. you know, agreed. Agreed. And I think that that's a great way to, to come back to it. I think that those, the first, the first three records are essential um as far as this band i mean and you think about it foreigners on the road to this day with a cover yeah. basically a cover band with mick sometimes joining <laughs> uh and they they still live on sometimes they yeah, exactly they they still live on these songs they still i mean these all these songs you know, hot blooded blue morning blue double vision long long way from home cold as ice feels like the first time i mean the, all of these songs are being played on the on tour mm-hmm. this, this summer i'm sure by, by the foreigner band you know? but i think they're winding it up though are they? Yeah. 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 Just in time for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Of course. I, I, that was the last thing I was going to bring up. I think that's a good way to end this one is to say they finally got what on the ballot, was it, mm-hmm. this year, this past year? Yeah. And they didn't, they don't think they, they didn't get in, right? Or they, I don't know. I, I know it that it just came out. Okay. So they haven't done it yet. But apparently, I know that's another story. There's a lot of stories around Foreigner. The other story was that apparently they put somebody Mick Jones and his manager went in and had a, just had a really big argument with um, the guy from Rolling Stone. Um, you know, what's his name? Oh, Jan Wenner. Jan Wenner. And that apparently insulted him. And Jan Wenner said when they were leaving, he said, it'll be a cold day in hell when foreigner gets in the hall of fame. So who knows what they said to him? They didn't, they wasn't good, whatever they said. And so no, well, but Jan Wenner, He's not really with the Rock Hall anymore, is he? Didn't he kind of like step down from something? Maybe that, that wrong. maybe that explains it. <laughs> that the foreigners on the ballot finally. That might be yeah. it. 2024 nominees. So yeah. they could get in. It's foreigner. And of course, Peter Frampton's on the ballot. Yeah. Well, they and both a lot of other people, in. but Tom, there's a lot of other people on there. I'm going, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, same here. I saw the list and I was like, yeah. okay. But hey, at least Foreigner's on the uh, on the ballot. So, and they come on, Foreigner deserves to be in the Hall of. Come on, they totally deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Well, they sold a lot of records, and usually the Rock Hall bases everything on record sales. And uh, well, they sold a lot of records. They sure did. And Sticks deserves to be in there too. Agreed. Absolutely. And they Frampton, have a longer they have a longer track record than Foreigner, for God's sakes. Yeah, Peter Frampton. At least from his work in the herd and uh, humble pie and his solo career, but I mean, you could also say, well, what really did Peter Frampton really sell? He had the one live album that went crazy, but his other records really didn't set the world on fire. No, they didn't. I don't they, know. Yeah, he had a lot of records that kind of just didn't do much of anything, but but just that just that legendary live record. I mean, just that alone, just. But under- just his career, for God's sakes, and the bands he's been and Humble in Pie and, stuff, yeah. 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 I don't know if Humble Pie's in there. I, I doubt it. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they are. But Cher might be in it. Cher will be Cher, so You Cher, should Cher be pretty happy be about that. Because I heard that you have an extensive Cher catalog in your collection. Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm... I'm you know, do you believe in life, life after love or whatever? Well, you know what? If you look at this, I was just a thought. You've got Cher, but shouldn't Sonny and Cher be in here instead of just Cher? Because I don't know. Didn't Sonny make her a star? Basically? Yeah. Sonny was very, uh, he was basically learned everything from Phil Spector. Because yeah. he used to work all those sessions and he was like Phil's right hand man to some degree. And whenever you heard any of Sonny stuff, it sounded like a Phil Spector album. And yeah, he wrote everything he was what made share share oh, um i think probably sunny needs to get some kind of notoriety but who am i i don't run the rock hall so yeah well if share gets odd. in if share gets in she will thank sunny there's no question because he basically made her career he did um but uh well hey i don't we're we're way way we are grant and i this is what we do we go way off topic and we love it we love being off topic it's, yeah, it's just about Tom, it's just about talking music, so yeah, it is. Yeah. It's all ta- it's all about the music, and that's what we're that's what we're about, and that's what we do on these channels. So, um, so I'm going to wrap it up. 
um, we, uh, we did a good job with these foreigner records. We both are just, you know, it's basically a tie, but we had to pick one. So, um, but, uh, but I want to thank Grant again. Thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. Sure. It was fun. It's always fun talking music, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate you coming on here and, and, uh, sharing your, your, your viewpoints and your opinions and your, all the sidetracks and it's just, it's a blast. We always have a good time. Yeah. So, so thanks again. And, um, and we'll see you next time on Curlis Mania. Thanks a lot. Good night. Oh, man.